a man that I knew not particularly well, but held in high esteem by the name of James Foster Reese, who worked for the National Church for years and years and years, and, and not all that many months ago died uh, in his 90s, was heard to say, and I've probably repeated it more often than he did, I'd like to say a few words before I begin to speak. This is the beginning of the stewardship campaign, or the pledge drive, or whatever other name we choose to give it. And I think in most of our minds, stewardship has become so closely associated to money that we lose track of the fact that it's bigger than that. Too often for us in the church, stewardship becomes about fundraising. Don't get me wrong, that is a big piece of what we understand stewardship to be. But if stewardship is only about money, we're missing a big part of the message. A man other than James Foster Reese, but I know him with three names, Douglas John Hall, uh, wrote a book on stewardship years and years and years ago. And what he does is remind us what are some of the things that we need to be conscious of when we think of being stewards. It's not just stewards of money, but that is part of it, and that's what I will be talking about mostly from, from this point on. But we'll be to be stewards of, of the gifts that God has blessed us with. How do we use them or how do we fail to use them? We're to be stewards of God's creation. And for me as a young boy growing up on the farm, that was really where I kind of got interest, introduced to the whole concept of stewardship. We called it conservation. And I remember my father tried to, to strive for, as a farmer, holding all the water that fell on our farm on that land rather than letting it just run away. I suppose if he had been successful, that probably would have been somewhat counter to what God's intention for all of that might have been. But it was conservation. Stewardship was making the best use of and serving this land that God had blessed us with. But the, the piece that Douglas John Hall raised up that just kind of blew me away when I first read it is we're also called as the Church of Jesus Christ to be stewards of Christ's kingdom on this earth. And what might that mean for us? when we think of being stewards of Christ's kingdom here on earth. Either God is putting an awful lot of trust in us or his expectations for us are probably somewhat higher than we have for ourselves. But not in the story of the widow's mite. Uh, our practice for the last year or so at Heartland comes closer to the practice that was in Jesus' time with the synagogue and the temple. You know, we've had baskets sitting back there at the door for people to walk out and, and put their offering in on the way out. <clears throat> That's kind of the way it worked for uh, Jesus' day. Only my picture is colored by uh, some of the famous religious artwork that we used in our Sunday school, the, it wasn't a little basket. It was a big jug. It was essentially a, one of those wine jugs that uh, Jesus turned from water to wine at the wedding feast. Big jug. And when people came out after their time at the service, they would drop their offerings in. And it brings me to one of the first lessons that I think is important for us. We live in a world where we're always comparing ourselves to each other. 
you know, all too easy for me to measure my value, my worth, in relationship to you guys. We live in a culture that can turn anything into a contest. I don't care whether it's women's beauty, men's masculinity, spelling, math, science fairs, football, basketball, golf. We can turn anything into a contest. And I was raised in the epitome of a family that had to, to be competing all the time. We couldn't sit down and play cards at home without my dad getting out those old wooden matches. They're still made, but each of us got a certain number of wooden matches and we wagered on our, our card games. Never bet money, but those matchsticks became valuable for us. We can. We can do it whether we're amazing, whether we come to church more often than somebody else. So much of that is, I think, the world influencing us with this spirit of competition which is never found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But, and I hope this strikes fear into your hearts just a little bit, this story says that Jesus positioned himself right by those baskets back there. And what did he do? He watched what you put in it. I've spent a lot of years in the Presbyterian Church USA debating whether ministers should know what church members give. And you know, when we come to talk about stewardship, we always make sure we include envelopes so that you can seal what your gift is from the rest of the world around you. But what I think this story of the widow's might does is it reminds us that we can hide what we give from our neighbors, but there's one that we can't hide from. And it reminds us that Jesus paid attention. He sat there and watched rich people put in great big offerings. He watched a poor widow, who was probably the only one in the room or at that synagogue embarrassed by her gift, who put in the two copper coins that are worth only a penny. But that's where I think our second lesson comes, because we have a tendency to measure who's the best, who gives the most, who attends church the most regularly, but that's, if I'm getting this passage right, that's not the way God measures it. He measures your gift based upon not how much went into the basket or the jar. He measures your gift based upon how much you kept out for yourself. And if you stop to think about that for a minute, what you keep for yourself says something about how much do I trust God to keep his promises to me? I used to think that talked about percentage giving, and I think there's arguments for percentage giving, but that's not even what it's about. It's about how much do I think I need for me? I'm fortunate, I'm blessed. Oh, there were a few days in our early marriage years that we had some times when I wasn't too sure about how we were going to get all the bills paid. But there haven't been too many times in my life when I've been down to that, that last dollar. I've always managed to keep back enough and then some for myself. In spite of what I believe, and I mean that. I believe that God is going to watch out for me.
How much do we keep out for ourselves? Then if we jump to the Gospel of Luke, we have this curious little passage about your giving and your gifts. And when I read it, I'm always reminded of my college years. I had a minor in psychology for whatever good that may have done me. Uh, but there are a couple of things from those psychology classes that have remained with me over the years. And one was this, this discussion about do you believe your way into acting or do you act your way into believing? Do you believe your way into acting or do you act your way into believing? And after many, many years, I've come to the conclusion that the answer is yes. For some of us, it is we believe our way into acting. For others of us, it is we act first and then our belief follows that. But this particular passage takes one side of that argument and that's where it puts his money. The last phrase, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart. One big piece of what I was talking about at the beginning, you know, about stewardship, one of the biggest, Alex likes to talk about bumps in the passage when we're, we're discussing uh, these passages before he preaches on them. One of the, the big bumps for me is that I don't know because I'm not brave enough to do what this actually says. But I do know from a lot of my experiences that where I spend the biggest share of my money is the place that I pay the greatest attention to in my life. It's interesting because the, there's a fairly long passage right before this, this little one that talks about what worries you. What keeps you awake at night? Is it having enough food to eat? Being able to make the house payment? Being able to make the car payment? Is it having enough money for rent? Is it, are my children going to have enough? Can I pay the medical bills? Because you see, I probably, even though I think since Thea and I retired, I do much better than I ever did before. But I probably always will make sure that I think I have enough put aside to take care of all those things that I worry about. But do we worry about being stewards of God's earthly kingdom? Do we worry about taking care of God's creation? Do we worry about those things to the point that it leads us to make this discipline of giving a spiritual practice, not just a financial one? Because you see, I've, I know I've said it before, and I've said it in October when we've had stewardship campaigns. I believe this whole business of giving is a spiritual practice and discipline. When I mention spiritual practices, what pops into my mind and I think into most other people's minds is, well, prayer is a spiritual practice. Worship is a spiritual practice. 
but very seldom does it pop into my mind that my giving is a spiritual practice. My sharing is a spiritual practice. It's a discipline that doesn't just help other people. It's a discipline that brings me closer to God. So in spite of the fact that we will probably be urging you to give more dollars so that this church can do more things and pay you know, rising costs and heat and, and that kind of stuff, I'd like you to contemplate during the weeks ahead how does my giving help me be more open to God's spirit being alive and active in me? How much is enough to make me really be open to God? And let God in and God lead the life that I live. Amen.